Uh, so Genesis 24, you'll find that on page 17. I'm going to read uh, verses 1 to 9, and then we'll read from verse 58 uh, through to the end of the chapter. Uh, Abraham was now old, getting on in years, and the Lord had blessed him in everything. Abraham said to his servant, the elder of his household, who managed all he owned, Place your hand under my thigh, and I will have you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live, but will go to the land and my family to take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Suppose the woman is unwilling to follow me to this land. Should I have your son go back to the land you came from? Abraham answered him, Make sure that you don't take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from my native land, who spoke to me and swore to me, I will give this land to your offspring. He will send his angel before you, and you can take a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to follow you, then you are free from this oath to me. But don't let my son go back there. So the servant placed his hand under his master Abraham's thigh and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. Uh, Now we're going to go down to uh, verse 58, which is on page 19, and we'll read through to the end of the chapter. So page 19 from verse 58. They called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She replied, I will go. So they sent away their sister Rebekah with the one who had nursed and raised her, and Abraham's servant and his men. They blessed Rebekah, saying to her, Our sister, may you become thousands upon ten thousands. May your offspring possess the city gates of their enemies. Then Rebekah and her female servants got up, mounted the camels, and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and left. Now Isaac was returning from Beer Lahai Roy, for he was living in the Negev region. In the early evening, Isaac went out to walk in the field, and looking up, he saw camels coming. Rebekah looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is that man in the field coming to meet us? The servant answered, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac everything he had done. And Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother Sarah and took Rebekah to be his wife. Isaac loved her and he was comforted after his mother's death. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Keep that passage open. Uh, If you're a note taker in the bulletin, there's an outline of where we're heading today. And so let's pray as we consider this part of God's word this morning. Gracious Father, we thank you so much that you are a God who speaks to us. And Father, we thank you so much that you speak to us through your written word, the Bible, and through the word become flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, We pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts that accept your word this morning, and that you would give us great wisdom to know how to live in the light of it this week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Growing up, I loved country music, uh, and my favourite country music singer was a guy called Adam Harvey. Uh, A lot of country music songs tell a story, don't they? And that's true for Adam Harvey's songs. Uh, One song in particular uh, recalls a conversation that Harvey had with his grandpa uh, when his grandpa walked into his office. Uh, Speaking of his grandpa, uh, the song goes like this. He shook his head and then said, I don't understand how all these deals are done. It just don't make no sense to me to deal with people you don't see. 
that we did it so much differently when I was young, when the shake of a hand was all you really needed. The strength of a man was in his word. And you could look him in the eye and know just where you stand. A man was made on the shake of a hand. It makes a world of difference, doesn't it? Uh, when someone is true to their word. It makes them trustworthy. Uh, when you can rely on their promises. But the trouble is that we don't have a great track record when it comes to keeping our word. Often don't, do we? Uh, in Genesis, we're introduced to a God who makes promises and who keeps promises. And God's faithfulness is centre stage in our passage today. Uh, We're told, verse 1, that the Lord blessed Abraham in everything. Uh, God's blessing of Abraham has marked him since God called him out of darkness and idolatry. It's marked him even through Abraham's unfaithfulness. Uh, What's God's blessing of Abraham? Well, we learned it back in Genesis 12, didn't we? God promised that through Abraham, God would have a people who are his very own, enjoying God's blessing by living in his place under his good and gracious rule, a a people called into right relationship with God. And God promised that through his people, He would bless all the nations, all the different people groups on earth. And yet all the way along, we've noticed that the easier road for Abraham, the the easiest road for humanity, has been to live by sight and not by faith. At every turn, there seems to be a problem or a dilemma. At the promise that God would set his people in a land in his place? Well, they're in Canaan, but but the land certainly doesn't belong to them. And a people? Offspring? Well, that seemed laughable, didn't it? Certainly to Sarah, you'll remember. She and Abraham were old. And Sarah? Well, she was barren. And so early on, living by sight rather than by faith, saw Abraham bring about offspring in his own way. But over the course of his life, Abraham has seen God's faithfulness time and time again. He saw that God always accomplishes what he plans. Sarah did give birth. But again, come our passage today, Genesis 24, we're met with a problem, with a dilemma. At the end of Genesis 23, he's just reported Sarah's death. And their son, Isaac, the one through whom God's promise was to carry, is single. And so Abraham commissions his servant to find a wife for Isaac back in Mesopotamia, among the family from which Abraham came. Notice in our passage that Abraham is being changed by God's grace and faithfulness such that he's making decisions within the framework of God's faithfulness to his promises. Abraham is living out the expectation of God's promise that his descendants would inherit the land. Indeed, you remember from last week that it was in the very heart of Canaan that a cave had been purchased as Sarah's resting place. And notice in our passage that Isaac, the one through whom the promise would flow, is not permitted to leave the land, verse 6. You see, Abraham has seen and experienced God's faithfulness to his promise before, and so he's exercising trust 
in response to God's faithfulness. Now look at what Abraham has to say of God in verse 7. Verse 7, the Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from her father's house and from my native land, who spoke to me and swore to me, I will give this land to your offspring. He will send his angel before you and you can take a wife for my son from there. Here is a man who is acting in response to a God who has never failed him. I'm sure that's true of the relationships in your life. The degree to which someone keeps their word is the degree to which you trust them and the framework from within which you make your decisions in response to what they say. Verse 10, Abraham's servant heads off and acts on behalf of his master in the light of God's proven faithfulness. Verse 12, he asks the Lord to fulfill his promise to act consistently with God's character of grace or undeserved kindness and that the one whom the Lord chooses is the girl who, at the well, says to the servant, verse 14, Drink, and I'll water your camels also. Notice then that the servant finishes praying, looks up, and there's Rebecca. Verse 17, the servant runs to meet her and asks for the water from her jug, to which she responds, verse 18, drink, my Lord. And verse 19, I'll also water your camels until they have enough to drink. The conversation continues. Rebecca offers the servant lodging. And his response, look there from verse 26. The servant's response to all that's happened. Verse 26, the man bowed down, worshipped the Lord and said, Praise the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not withheld his kindness and faithfulness from my master. What does he do in response? Well, he praises the God who keeps his word. The Lord who is faithful to his promises, to the Lord who shows grace, undeserved kindness to his people. You see, it's one thing to make promises, isn't it? We can all do that. But it's quite another to keep promises. As we move on in the story and the servant meets Rebecca's family, they confirm God's faithfulness. Verse 31, Laban, Rebecca's brother, sees that Abraham, through his servant, is blessed by the Lord. The servant, verse 33, asks permission to recount the Lord's faithfulness to his promise. The servant recounts his objection about what if the woman woman was unwilling to come back with him? He recounts Abraham's response, that we are to act within the framework of the Lord's faithfulness. And it's for the woman and her family to do the same. The servant goes on to explain that all that's happened, his, his prayer and his meeting with Rebecca, and he tells how the Lord has kept his word. The response, verse 50, Laban and Bethuel answered, This is from the Lord. We have no choice in the matter. Rebecca is here in front of you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife for your master's son, just as the Lord has spoken. How do they respond? <laughs> They confirm the Lord's faithfulness, don't they? They recognize that these events are from the God who keeps his word. And so they now act in the light of it. The next morning, the servant is ready to go back to Canaan. But Rebecca's family seem to to dally. They want her for another 10 days. And so they put it to Rebecca herself. 
Her response, verse 58, I will go. I will go. Isn't that so reminiscent of Abraham? Back in Genesis 12, called by God to leave his country, his people, his father's household, and to go to the land that the Lord would show him. And here, Rebecca's decision to go is framed by God's faithfulness. Now, one day as you look through the passage to verse 60, what the blessing of verse 60 reminds you of as Rebecca's family bids her farewell. Well, isn't it similar to the blessing given to Abraham? God's promise that through Abraham, God would gather his people in his place, under his glorious rule, and so enjoy his blessing. And that through his people, God would bless the peoples of the earth. And so our passage ends with a solution to the dilemma that it began with. How would God remain faithful to his promise with Sarah dead and Isaac single? Verse 67, Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother Sarah and took Rebekah to be his wife. Isaac loved her and he was comforted after his mother's death. Friends, I'm wondering whether you're seeing a recurring theme all the way through Genesis. You see, in Genesis, uh, we're seeing a God who keeps his word. We're seeing a God who keeps his word. But how can we be absolutely sure that he is a God who keeps his word? How can we be certain that God really will gather a people who are his very own, who will live in his place under his rule? Well, ultimately, ultimately we know that because God showed up in our world, didn't he? We know that God is absolutely committed to his word because he showed up in our world, in the person of his son. And how can we have confidence that God will bless the nations of the earth through Jesus and through his people? Well, he gives us a marvellous picture of it, doesn't he? That passage that Ros read out for us before, Revelation 7, of a multitude from every nation, tribe, language and people gathered around the throne of the Lamb. Friends, this is God's mission in his world. This is his plan for the world. God is in the business of blessing men and women and children from every nation by giving them new life in Jesus. And they hear about this new life in Jesus as God's redeemed, increasingly transformed people live in the light of God's faithfulness. Notice in our reading from Matthew 28 that that's what Jesus asked his disciples to do, to live in the light of God's word when he commanded them to go and make disciples of all nations. Well, what does all this mean for us? What does all this mean for us? Well, brothers and sisters, if God is true to his his word, if it's true that God is gathering a people for himself from every nation, tribe, language and people, if it's true that God's desire is to bless the nations, that is to rescue men and women from sin, death and his judgment by his grace through faith in Jesus Christ, well, it means that any decision that you make in response to God's faithfulness to his word, is not in vain. 
You see, maybe you're a parent struggling as you seek to point your kids to Jesus and it seems a slog at times. And you wonder whether it's worth it, especially when they seem disinterested or even when they respond by saying they don't believe it. Press on. Press on. God is true to his word. Maybe you're someone struggling to live in our sexualized world that constantly tells you that to really be fulfilled in life, to really live life, then you need to express yourself sexually. Well, if God is true to his word, then that message that the world's telling you is a lie. If God is true to his word, then your true identity, then to really live, it's not in your sexuality or on acting on your sexuality. No, your identity is in Christ. It's who you are in him. Maybe you've just received some devastating news about your health. Maybe maybe you're struggling with sickness. Well, if God's true to his word, then it means that you have an exit from the grave. You have a glorious hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. If God is true to his word, then it means that God loves the people of Central Asia and longs for them to find lasting hope in Jesus. If God is true to his word, then it means that men and women and children can only know lasting hope as they come in repentance and faith to Jesus. It means that without Jesus, they are in the same danger as we are without Christ, standing under God's just judgment. And so if God is true to his word, as we're seeing through Genesis, then it's not folly to send workers into the harvest field, even a harvest field where it's dangerous to be one of God's people, even more so to call others to be one of God's people. Why? Because if God is true to his word, then it means that that the person in dangerous Central Asia who, who trusts in Jesus is eternally far safer than the person in safe Australia who doesn't trust in Jesus. The person who trusts in Jesus in dangerous Central Asia will always be eternally far safer than the person in safe Australia who doesn't trust in Jesus. That's true, isn't it? If God is true to his word, which we're seeing all the way through Genesis. If God is true to his word, then it means that you can throw your whole lot in with Jesus. That's what it means to be blessed by God, to be in a right relationship with God through Jesus. I'm sure that many of you receive Christmas letters. I used to enjoy reading the Christmas letters that my parents receive. Uh, But sometimes they can be all so predictable, can't they? Uh, Like this one. Uh, Alistair's just got a promotion in the law firm. He sold his unit in Bondi. And he's bought a house in Hunters Hill. Uh, He's sad not to be skiing in France this year, so he settled instead on skiing in New Zealand. That's all well and good, isn't it? Good on Alistair. But what does it matter if he doesn't trust in Christ? If God is true to his word, it means that it would be more joyful to read a letter that says this. Alistair's lost his job at the law firm. 
He's found a unit in Parramatta and a job packing shelves at Woolies, but he's clinging on to hope in Jesus. Friends, throw your whole lot in with Jesus. Live in the light of his faithfulness. Why? Because he will never, ever fail you. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you so much that your word introduces us to a God who makes big promises and who keeps big promises. Father, we pray that we would be people increasingly changed by your grace such that we make decisions based on your faithfulness to your word, that we would be people who throw our lot in with Jesus such that we long for men and women and children from every tribe, nation, people and language, finding lasting hope in Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.